in an old abbey town down in this part of the country a long, long while ago, so long that the story must be a true one because our great-grandfathers implicitly believed it. There officiated as sexton and gravedigger in the churchyard one Gabriel Grubb. Gabriel Grubb was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow, a morose and lonely man who consorted with nobody but himself and an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large, deep waistcoat pocket. A little before twilight, one Christmas Eve, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lighted his lantern, and betook himself towards the old churchyard, for he'd got a grave to finish by next morning. As he went his way up the ancient street, he saw the cheerful light of the blazing fires gleam through the old casements, and heard the loud laugh and the cheerful shouts of those who were assembled around him. All this was gall and wormwood to the heart of Gabriel Grubb, and when groups of children bounded out of the houses, tripped across the road, and were met before they could knock at the opposite door by half a dozen curly-headed little rascals who crowded round them as they flocked upstairs to spend the evening in their Christmas games. Gabriel smiled grimly and clutched the handle of his spade with a firmer grasp as he thought of measles, scarlet fever, thrush, whooping cough, and a good many other sources of consolation besides. In this happy frame of mind, Gabriel strode along until he turned into the dark lane which led to the churchyard. Now, Gabriel had been looking forward to reaching the dark lane because it was, generally speaking, a nice, gloomy, mournful place in which the townspeople didn't much care to go except in broad daylight and when the sun was shining. Consequently, he was not a little indignant to hear a young urchin roaring out some jolly song about a Merry Christmas in this very sanctuary, which had been called Coffin Lane ever since the days of the old abbey and the time of the shaven-headed monks. Gabriel waited until the boy came up, then dodged him into a corner, wrapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times to teach him to modulate his voice. And as the boy hurried away with his hand to his head, singing quite a different sort of tune, Gabriel Grubb chuckled very heartily to himself and entered the churchyard, locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, put down his lantern, and getting into the unfinished grave, worked at it for an hour or so with a right good will. But the earth was hardened with the frost, and it was no very easy matter to break it up and shovel it out. And although there was a moon, it was a very young one, and shed little light upon the grave which was in the shadow of the church. At any other time, these obstacles would have made Gabriel Grubb very moody and miserable. But he's so well pleased with having stopped the small boy singing that he took little heed of the scanty progress he had made and looked down into the grave when he'd finished work for the night with grim satisfaction, singing as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one, brave lodgings for one, a few feet of cold earth when life is done. A stone at his head, a stone at the feet, a rich juicy meal for the worms to eat, rank grass overhead and damp clay around, brave lodgings for one these in holy ground. Ho, oh, ho, oh, a coffin at Christmas, a Christmas box. Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. <laughs> Gabriel paused in some alarm in the act of raising the wicker bottle to his lips and looked around. The bottom of the oldest grave about him was not more still and quiet than the churchyard in the pale moonlight. The cold hoar frost glistened on the tombstones and sparkled like rows of gems among the stone carvings of the old church. The snow lay hard and crisp upon the ground, 
and spread over the thickly strewn mounds of earth so white and smooth a cover that it seemed as if corpses lay there, hidden only by their winding sheets. Not the faintest rustle broke the profound tranquility of the solemn scene. Sound itself appeared to be frozen up. All was so cold and still. "'Twas the echoes," said Gabriel Grubb, raising the bottle to his lips again. "'It was not!' Gabriel started up and stood rooted to the spot with astonishment and terror, for his eyes rested on a form that made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone close to him was a strange, unearthly figure. His long, fantastic legs, which might have reached the ground, were cocked up and crossed after a quaint, fantastic fashion. His sinewy arms were bare and his hands rested on his knees. On his short, round body, he wore a close covering ornamented with small slashes. A short cloak dangled at his back, the collar of which was cut into curious peaks, which served the goblin in lieu of ruff or neckchief. And his shoes curled up at his toes into long points. On his head, he wore a broad-brimmed sugarloaf hat, garnished with a single feather. The hat was covered with the white frost. The goblin looked as if he'd sat on the same tombstone very comfortably for two or three hundred years. He was sitting perfectly still. His tongue was put out as if in derision. He was grinning at Gabriel Grubb with such a grin as only a goblin could call up. It was not the echoes. Gabriel Grubb was paralyzed and could make no reply. What do you do here on Christmas Eve? I come to dig a grave, sir. What man wanders among graves and churchyards on such a night as this? Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! A wild chorus seemed to fill the churchyard and Gabriel looked fearfully around, but nothing was to be seen. What have you got in that bottle? Horns, sir, replied the sexton, trembling more than ever, for he'd bought it of the smugglers, and he thought that perhaps his questioner might be in the excise department of the goblins. Who drinks Hollands alone and in a churchyard on such a night as this? Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! And who then is our fair and lawful prize? Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! Well, Gabriel, what do you say to this? The sexton gasped for breath. What do you think of this, Gabriel? The goblin kicked up his feet in the air on either side of the tombstone and looked at the turned-up points with as much complacency as if he'd been contemplating the most fashionable pair of Wellingtons in all Bond Street. It's... it's very curious, sir. Very curious and very pretty, but I think I'll go back and finish my work, sir, if you please. Work? What work? The grave, sir, making the grave. Oh, the grave, eh? Who makes graves at a time when all other men are merry and takes a pleasure in it? Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb, I'm afraid my friends want you. Gabriel, Gabriel, I'm afraid my friends want you. They don't know me, sir. I don't think the gentlemen have ever seen me, sir. Yes, they have. We know the man with a sulky face and grim scowl who struck the boy tonight because the boy could be merry and he could not. We know him. We know him. We know him. We know him. <laughs> <laughs> Here the goblin gave a loud, shrill laugh, 
which the echoes return twentyfold, and throwing his legs up in the air, stood upon his head, or rather, upon the very point of his sugar loaf hat, on the narrow edge of the tombstone, whence he threw a somersault with extraordinary agility right to the sexton's feet. I, I'm afraid I must leave you, leave sir. Us, Gabriel Grubb, going to leave us. <laughs> As the goblin laughed, the sexton observed for one instant a brilliant illumination within the windows of the church, as if the whole building were lighted up. It disappeared. The organ pealed forth a lively air, and whole troops of goblins, the very counterpart of the first one, poured into the churchyard and began playing at leapfrog with the tombstones, never stopping for an instant to take breath, but overing the highest among them, one after the other, with the most marvellous dexterity. The first goblin was the most astonishing leaper, and none of the others could come near him. Even in the extremity of his terror, the sexton could not help observing that while his friends were content to leap over common-sized gravestones, the first one took the family vaults, iron railings and all with as much ease as if there'd been so many street posts. At last, the game reached a most exciting pitch. The organ played quicker and quicker. The goblins leapt faster and faster coiling themselves up, rolling head over heels upon the ground and bounding over the tombstones like footballs. The sexton's brain whirled round with the rapidity of the motion he beheld and his legs reeled beneath him as the spirits flew before his eyes. When the goblin king, suddenly darting towards him, laid his hand upon his collar and sank with him through the earth. When Gabriel Grubb had had time to fetch his breath, which the rapidity of his descent had for a moment taken away, he found himself in what appeared to be a large cavern, surrounded on all sides by crowds of goblins, ugly and grim. In the center of the room, on an elevated seat, was stationed his friend of the churchyard, who was apparently king of the goblins. Cold tonight, very cold, a glass of something warm here. At this command, half a dozen officious goblins with a perpetual smile upon their faces, whom Gabriel Grubb imagined to be courtiers on that account, hastily disappeared and presently returned with a goblet of liquid fire, which they presented to the king, whose cheeks and throat were transparent as he tossed down the flame. Ah, this warms one indeed. Bring a bumper of the same for Mr. Grubb. It was in vain for the unfortunate sexton to protest that he was not in the habit of taking anything warm at night. One of the goblins held him while another poured the blazing liquid down his throat. The whole assembly screeched with laughter as he coughed and choked and wiped away the tears which gushed plentifully from his eyes after swallowing the burning draught. The king leant forward, fantastically poking the taper corner of his sugar loaf hat into the sexton's eye, thereby occasioning him the most exquisite pain. And now, show the man of misery and gloom a few of the pictures from our great storms. Immediately, a thick cloud which obscured the remoter end of the cavern rolled gradually away and disclosed, apparently at a great distance, a small and scantily furnished but neat and clean apartment.
A crowd of little children were gathered round a bright fire, clinging to their mother's gown and gambling around her chair. The mother occasionally rose and drew aside the window curtain as if to look for some expected object. A frugal meal was ready spread upon the table and an elbow chair was placed near the fire. A knock was heard at the door. The mother opened it and the children crowded round her and clapped their hands for joy as their father entered. He was wet and weary and shook the snow from his garments as the children crowded round him and seizing his cloak, hat, stick and gloves with busy zeal ran with them from the room. Then as he sat down to his meal before the fire, the children climbed about his knee and the mother sat by his side and all seemed happiness and comfort. But a change came upon the view almost imperceptibly and the scene was altered to a small bedroom. Here the fairest and youngest child lay dying. The roses had fled from his cheek and the light from his eye. And even as the sexton looked upon him with an interest he had never felt or known before, he died. His young brothers and sisters crowded round his little bed and seized his tiny hand so cold and heavy, but they shrank back from its touch and looked with awe on his infant face, for calm and tranquil as it was, and sleeping in rest and peace, as the beautiful child seemed to be, they saw that he was dead. And they knew that he was an angel looking down upon and blessing them from a bright and happy heaven. <laughs> Again the light cloud passed across the picture and again the subject changed. The father and mother were old and helpless now and the number of those about them was diminished more than half. But content and cheerfulness sat on every face and beamed in every eye as they crowded round the fireside and told and listened to old stories of earlier and bygone days. Slowly and peacefully, the father sank into the grave and soon after, the sharer of all his cares and troubles followed him to a place of rest. The few who yet survived them knelt by their tomb and watered the green turf which covered it with their tears, then rose and turned away, sadly and mournfully, but not with bitter cries or despairing lamentations, for they knew that they one day should meet again. The cloud settled upon the picture and concealed it from the sexton's view. What do you think of that? It's... it's very pretty. You miserable man, you! The goblin appeared disposed to add more, but indignation choked his utterance, so he lifted up one of his very pliable legs and flourishing it above his head a little to ensure his aim, administered a good sound kick to Gabriel Grubb, immediately after which all the goblins in waiting crowded round the wretched sexton and kicked him without mercy, according to the established and invariable custom of courtiers upon earth, who kick whom royalty kicks and hug whom royalty hugs. Him some more. The cloud was dispelled, and a rich and beautiful landscape was disclosed to view. There's just such another to this day within half a mile of the old abbey town. The sun shone from out the clear blue sky. The water sparkled beneath his rays and the trees looked greener and the flowers more gay beneath his cheering influence. 
The water rippled on with a pleasant sound. The trees rustled in the light wind that murmured among their leaves. The birds sang upon the boughs, and the lark caroled on high her welcome to the morning. Yes, it was morning, the bright, balmy morning of summer. The minutest leaf. The smallest blade of grass was instinct with life. The ant crept forth to her daily toil. The butterfly fluttered and basked in the warm rays of the sun. Myriads of insects spread their transparent wings and reveled in their brief but happy existence. Man walked forth, elated with the scene. And all was brightness and splendor. You miserable man! Again, the king of the goblins gave his leg a flourish, and again it descended on the shoulders of the sexton, and again the attendant goblins imitated the example of their chief. Many a time the cloud went and came, and many a lesson it taught to Gabriel. Who, although his shoulders smarted with pain from the frequent application of the goblin's feet, looked on with an interest that nothing could diminish. He saw that men who worked hard and earned their scanty bread with lives of labor were cheerful and happy, and that to the most ignorant, the sweet face of nature was a never-failing source of cheerfulness and joy. He saw that women. The tenderest and most fragile of all God's creatures were the oftenest superior to sorrow, adversity, and distress. He saw that it was because they bore in their own hearts an inexhaustible wellspring of affection and devotion. Above all, he saw that men like himself, who snarled at the mirth and cheerfulness of others. Were the foulest weeds on the fair surface of the earth, and setting all the good of the world against the evil, he came to the conclusion that it was a very decent and respectable sort of world after all. No sooner had he formed it. Then the cloud which closed over the last picture seemed to settle on his senses and lull him to repose. One by one, the goblins faded from his sight, and as the last one disappeared, he sunk to sleep. The day had broken when Gabriel Grubb awoke. And found himself lying at full length on the flat gravestone in the churchyard, with the wicker bottle lying empty by his side, and his coat, spade, and lantern, all well whitened by the last night's frost, scattered on the ground. The stone on which he had first seen the goblin seated stood bolt upright before him, and the grave at which he had worked the night before was not far off. At first, he began to doubt the reality of his adventures, but the acute pain in his shoulders when he attempted to rise assured him that the kicking of the goblins was certainly not a dream. Gabriel Grubb got on his feet as well as he could for the pain in his back, and brushing the frost off his coat, put it on and turned his face towards the town. But he was an altered man. And he couldn't bear the thought of returning to a place where his repentance would be scoffed at and his reformation disbelieved. He hesitated for a few moments, and then turned away to wonder where he might and seek his bread elsewhere. There were a great many speculations about the sexton's fate at first, but it was speedily determined that he'd been carried away by the goblins. And there were not wanting some very credible witnesses who had distinctly seen him whisked through the air on the back of a chestnut horse, blind of one eye, with the hind quarters of a lion and the tail of a bear. At length, all this was devoutly believed, 
and the new sexton used to exhibit to the curious for a trifling emolument a good-sized piece of the church weathercock which had been accidentally kicked off by the aforesaid horse in his aerial flight and picked up by himself in the churchyard. Unfortunately, these stories were somewhat disturbed by the unlooked-for reappearance of Gabriel Grubb himself some ten years afterwards, a ragged, contented, rheumatic old man. He told his story to the clergyman and also to the mayor, and in the course of time it began to be received as a matter of history, in which form it has continued down to this very day. The believers in the weather cocktail, having misplaced their confidence once, were not easily prevailed upon to part with it again. So they looked as wise as they could, shrugged their shoulders, touched their foreheads, and murmured something about Gabriel Grubb having drunk all the Hollands and then fallen asleep on the flat tombstone, and they affected to explain what he supposed he had witnessed in the goblin's cavern by saying that he'd seen the world and grown wiser. But this opinion, which was by no means a popular one at any time, gradually died off, and be the matter how it may, as Gabriel Grubb was afflicted with rheumatism to the end of his days, this story has at least one moral, if it teach no better one. And that is that if a man turns sulky and drink by himself at Christmas time, he may make up his mind to be not a bit the better for it. Let the spirits be never so good, or let them be even as many degrees beyond proof as those which Gabriel Grubb saw in the goblin's cavern. Mm -hmm.